a very good evening everyone i dr kavneet kaur on behalf of the organizing committee welcome you all for the neuropathology webinar in the aims webinar series under my scope today we have with us dr sonika dahia sharing her expertise on evolving cns tumor classification i now invite professor chitra sarkar former dean aims and uh, former head department of pathology to introduce our guest speaker dr sonika dahia ma'am good evening it gives me immense pleasure to introduce one of my best students professor sonika dahia in today's aims webinar I think nothing gives greater pride to a teacher than the success and accomplishment of his or her student and Sonika Dahia is an example of this. She received her medical degree from Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College in Belgaum followed by her residency at Kasturba Medical College in Mangalore India. She continued her journey in the Department of Pathology at All India Institute of Medical Sciences at New Delhi from 2000 to 2003. During her senior residency, she worked with me in neuropathology. She was always extremely hard working, diligent, dedicated, very knowledgeable and of course ever smiling. Then in 2003, she decided to move to greener pastures to the land of opportunities that is the us i played a small role in this when dr david louis the head of the department of pathology at the harvard medical school wrote to me to suggest someone who would like to uh, work on a breast pathology fellowship at his institute and i highly recommended sonika who was working with me those days she i must say she was extremely apprehensive because it was in molecular pathology which was very new in those days as you can understand in 2003 but i encouraged her to go and there has been no turning back following her stint in the molecular pathology unit at the mass general hospital and harvard medical school in boston although she did uh, she was offered a position of assistant professor here at aims she decided to pursue an anatomic pathology residency at the new york university usa which was followed by neuropathology fellowship at washington university she then joined as an assistant professor in the department of pathology and immunology at the washington university school of medicine in st louis in 2011 she rose the academic ranks quickly to become a professor in 2020 and washu continues to be her home away from home she has not changed or jumped university she uh, and she has now become the head of neuro oncology pathology at washu her translational work in brain tumors through national and international presentations has resulted in over 140 uh, publications reviews and book chapters with a current h index of 35 she is chair of the awards committee of the american association of neuropathologists first ever indian to have achieved this honor member of the education committee of the american association of neuropathologists american board of pathology is continuing certification part lifelong learning and self assessment task force and the uh, scientific committee of children's brain tumor group network she has completed several research projects including one from nih as well as several private foundations she is an ex excellent teacher and has mentored a large number of young physicians researchers including medical students residents and fellows as well as junior faculty members She serves on the editorial board of Modern Pathology and Free Neuropathology and is in the abstract review committee of US CAP and SNO and a certified scientific reviewer on many national and international grants. So uh welcome again uh, once again Sonika and we look forward to this evening's academic feast from you. I would like to uh, thank our head of the department dr venkat ayer and his entire team of young assistant professors dr archil kavneet uh, madhu ruchi aruna 
and all the staff of the department, all the faculty members who have, uh, who so meticulously get together to organize this webinar every month. It is because of their drive and initiative that in spite of the COVID pandemic and the challenges that these webinars continue and are so popular. I must thank my neuropathology colleagues, Dr. M.C. Sharma and Dr. Vaishali Suri for moderating the session. And I thank once and all, uh, everyone and uh, for this organizing this webinar. And I thank Dr. Sonika Dahiya for accepting our invitation and welcome once again. Thank you. Thank you so very much, ma'am. This was uh, so kind and generous of you. I I don't think I deserve so much, you know, and coming from a mentor, it, it means really uh, a lot and it has made me um, uh, emotional. Um, I will say that as a trainee of, um, of AIMS and as a mentee of, of the department, you know, with having worked with uh, you and several other folks, including Professor Verma and uh, um, several other people in the department, you know, uh, this journey has, uh, would not have been possible without your support, you know, and uh, I am extremely thankful for that journey as well as for this continuous process of learning and, and growing, you know, and um, uh, also for extending this uh, warm invitation to uh, to uh, present this webinar uh, to you folks. So this is a great privilege and an honor and uh, a distinct pleasure, ma'am. So thank you. And thanks to all the organizers and for and the organizing committee for extending this invite. With that, I will uh, share my screen and uh, we'll start. So as uh, uh, Professor Sarkar mentioned, I uh, work at WashU in St. Louis and you can see uh, it's the gateway to the West and there is a St. Louis uh, arch, you know, in the background, as you can see here, which is basically uh, a welcoming uh, from East to the West Coast, you know. So I'm not sure if I am, I'll be headed to West Coast in the near future, but certainly, you know, that's something uh, on the horizon. So before I start with my talk, I really wanted to um, share some glimpses of the place where I, uh, I work currently. And some of the images here, this is the Danforth campus of WashU. You can see here Children's Hospital. So uh, I'm in a unique position here. Not everybody here in, um, I mean, at Ames things are slightly different. We're folks have exposure to both the adult and the pediatric brain tumors under the same roof. And I am also lucky and fortunate to have such an experience. Now, this is the Children's Hospital and the Seitman Cancer Center, which is applies to the adult uh, neuro-oncology as well as to our children's. And this is the Barnes Jewish Hospital here, which caters to mostly the adult population. But there are more than uh, 30 hospitals that are affiliated, but these two are the big ones, Barnes Jewish Hospital and Children's Hospital. And the cancer center that we have goes by the name uh, Seitman Cancer Center. So it's a huge topic, like neuropathology is, is quite different from rest of the systems for several uh, reasons. And um, we don't have to necessarily go into the details of how and what is so different, but it is, it is indeed true that uh, in neuropath, not only does the architecture play an important role, which in histopathology overall does play a role, but also the mitotic count and going to high power is, uh, is almost uh, essential in every single case, you know, for appropriate grading of tumors. And uh, in neuropath, brain imaging acts as a surrogate for us to, to really uh, understand where, especially in stereotactic biopsies and all, where uh, the lesion is coming from. A, it will tell us the location, but it will also tell us whether the lesion is enhancing or non-enhancing. Enhancing lesions basically tell us there is uh, something wrong with the blood-brain barrier, there is leakage. 
And that's why the contrast agent that is being injected comes out and you see a variety of different patterns of enhancement. It could be neural enhancing nodule, it could be heterogeneous enhancement, it could be solid enhancing pattern. Uh, and more importantly, um, location. So like in real estate, you know, location plays an important role in brain um, tumors overall, uh, even though we've made a lot of uh, strides, you know, in terms of reaching to the current classification schema, location is such an integral part and it is becoming more evident over the last uh, several years that how the developing brain uh, can dictate, you know, some of the transcription factors and how those in turn can uh, play uh, a huge role in oncogenesis, you know, and brain tumor initiation as well as progression. Uh, and, and in that light, I, I think most folks uh, in the audience are aware that there is a new entity which was included, which is the diffuse midline. And we know that, for example, the supratentorial tumors overall are far more frequent in adult patients, whereas pediatric patients tend to have more often infratentorial tumors, uh, which is below the tentorium cerebelli. So tentorium cerebelli acts as a division for supra and infratentorial uh, compartments. So uh, essentially, uh, uh, location gives you a high probability of what tumor type you might be. So we all know in science and medicine, there are always exceptions, but at least by probability, we, we get a sense of what we might be dealing with. Patients' age is, again, uh, quite uh, important because in younger patients, we don't tend to think of, for example, metastatic tumors. Whereas in adult tumors, metastasis is the most common uh, CNS tumor. Um, if I said primary CNS tumor, then it would be obviously be glioma uh, in terms of malignant uh, primary CNS tumor, but overall METs constitute the most common CNS uh, tumors in adults. So as you can see, like in early 1920s, um, this, um, uh, Bailey and Cushing had published, you know, a classification scheme of leomas, and I don't want to go into the political aspect of what had happened during that time, but certainly, um, uh, as is evident here, there were not too many um, uh, uh, names or too many tumor types that were were given, but it's interesting. Uh, to note, and uh, what uh, attracts me is a term neuroepithelioma that was used. And that was essentially to state, you know, that tumors that are arising from neuroepithelium and that are looking more like a neuroepithelium, and then they were given different subtypes. And this term had become sort of extinct, I would say, for a while, you know, in between the classifications, you know, WHO blue books when they came. But now in the recent classification uh, schema, this term has again made an entry and we are using it more and more low grade and high grade neuroepithelial tumors, which essentially means something that has either glial or glioneuronal differentiation and, um, and is a term which is an umbrella term for both. Uh, of those. So um, while we were using an integrated diagnosis, you know, for a while uh, and, and for decades now in, in the last um, uh, several decades, there is, um, um, and, and that was the histological classification, the WHO gray. Uh, and this was being dictated by obviously the location, patient's age, imaging was taken into consideration, and then we were giving this diagnosis. But what happened in at the Harlem Consensus Conference was bringing off the molecular uh, information into this picture. And that led to a major change while uh, from 2007 to, to 2016. So while the edition remains the fourth edition of WHO, it really brought humongous change in bringing about the integration of molecular diagnostics into uh, our practice much more 
than what we were doing. We were using 1P19Q uh, co-deletions, for example, since uh, 1990s, you know, for oligodendroglioma diagnosis, that those tumors, the gliomas that have those alterations tended to have a good prognosis. And, and in, two, in some regard, you know, in 2000s, we got the INI1 as a magic marker, you know, as a protein product of SMARC-D1 mutation that, hey, when you have SMARC-D1 alteration, those tumors are ATRT, which stands for atypical teratoid raptoid tumor. So we knew uh, uh, fact, at least some things about genetics, not the entire thing, but now, uh, through the Harlem classification schema, we have started uh, integrating the molecular information. And two major things that happened in the 2016 uh, WHO classification, I think it will not be wrong to say, were essentially between the diffuse gliomas in adults and embryonal neoplasms in adults. And um, as you can already guess that in adults, diffuse gliomas are very frequent, and in children, embryonal neoplasms are common tumors. On the malignant side, benign tumors are the pilocytic astrocytoma and the ependymal neoplasms. But in the uh, in the malignant category, embryonal neoplasms constitute uh, the most common uh, neoplasms. So, few things happened in the diffuse gliomas. A um, IDH mutation was uh, uh, was brought as an important prognosticator as well as a diagnostic marker to distinguish um, diffuse gliomas that were IDH mutant versus IDH wild type given their uh, very different prognostic uh, behavior. So that was made mandatory. Now the gli diffuse gliomas that had IDH mutation, but also had ATRX mutation and P53 mutation were along the astrocytic lineage. And the ones with IDH mutation and 1P19Q co-deletions fell under the umbrella of oligodendrogliomas. And the ones that were wild type were called glioblastoma. In the embryonal neoplasms in children, the two major things that happened, I would uh, uh, would say, would be the medulloblastoma category, where integration of um, the pathways was uh, was given, like the sonic hedgehog pathway, the wind pathway altered, and then there were the non-wind non-sonic hedgehog. So broadly, three subgroups and the non-wind non-sonic hedgehog medulloblastomas were an umbrella term for group three and group four. And then there was one other tumor which got a lot of attention and that was the embryonal tumor with multi-layered rosettes, which was essentially an umbrella term to encompass three different tumor types of etanto, which stands for embryonal tumor with abundant uh, neuropil and true rosettes, ependymoblastoma and medulloepithelioma. And that was thought to be characterized by 19, chromosomal 19, microRNA uh, cluster amplification, so C19 MC alter. So those were essentially the major changes that happened in 2016. We are expecting a new WHO and uh, Professor Sarkar and several other members, in Dr. Sharma and um, other uh, folks in the audience, I'm sure, are uh, the authors. And in fact, uh, Professor Sarkar played an important role in the scene back now, which I'm going to come to. And so um, uh, there, they, we know that the WHO is expected sometimes uh, soon, perhaps uh, this end of this month or next month, you know, this is already the end. Uh, we were expecting uh, an inaugural at the ANP meeting, which was the neuropathologist uh, meeting in St. Louis, but it didn't happen. I think there was some issue with the publication, but I hear that an online version is, uh, is ready um, and it will be out pretty soon. Uh, so while the majority of the changes happened in the in the 2016 classification in the in the adult diffuse gliomas and embryonal neoplasms in children, 
the uh, community was very well aware that the pediatric uh, diffuse gliomas uh, is a void. So that area really needed a lot more work to be done. Uh, and uh, the work that needed to be done in that area uh, was essentially because of um, because of their lack of IDH mutation, lack of 1P19Q co-deletions in those tumors. So we are currently also mostly relying on histologic subtyping of these uh, tumors, diffuse gliomas in the children. And the two age groups, even though they might share ATRX alterations, they have an IDH wild type background in pediatric tumors. And then uh, the high proliferation indices that are seen in, in the younger age group. And then the pediatric diffuse gliomas, they tend to have lesser degree of malignant transformation as opposed to grade two to grade three and grade uh, four. Uh, designation, but now um, in the astrocytic lineage, for example, on the diffuse side. And adolescent gliomas is still a mixed bag, you know, of the pediatric and adult type gliomas and adult type tumors overall. But I'm sure as our understanding is growing, it looks like that there might be some novel alterations, especially in these adolescent uh, uh, group of uh, tumors. So a C impact now was formed, you know, because the, the, the experts were aware that there is a void in several areas and the, the uh, classification scheme. And as we were splitting the groups and as our understanding was growing, that we will be needing much more, you know, and sooner updates before the new WHO comes. And as you can see from 16 to 21, it's already five years or so. And we are still uh, expecting a new WHO. But the good thing that has happened is that these regular updates have made us more aware. And we have been incorporating these in our routine practice, which has made things uh, slightly uh, um, less complicated, I would say. I didn't want to say easier, but less complicated. And uh, this, uh, the C impact now was formed and it is essentially a consortium to inform molecular and practically approaches to CNS tumor taxonomy. As you can see, it is a, it's a mouthful of words. And this was, and not otherwise WHO, NOW stands for not otherwise WHO, but we now know that it's more or less, you know, WHO, um, has integrated majority of the updates that were um, that were uh, suggested, and uh, since then we've had like all seven uh, updates, uh, of which uh, essentially the update number six was a meeting in Netherlands, and uh, WHO the new WHO is uh, based on several of these, and update six incorporates. Uh, many of those uh, recommendations. So the major changes in the new WHO, I, my understanding is Dr. Lewis uh, has already given a talk um, on it. Uh, but uh, just to uh, summarize, um, and these are not all the changes, these are just few changes because um, uh, I didn't really want to go into the depth of things and I wanted to discuss you know some of the interesting cases that we've had in the recent times and uh, the major changes uh, are essentially to keep it consistent with the rest of the systems to bring in the Arabic numerals and that was because for a couple of reasons uh, one was that astrocytoma IDH mutant now we are not going to use the term diffuse astrocytoma anaplastic astrocytoma and to now if you use uh, Roman numerals they can be confusion so it was essentially to to get rid of that IDH testing is mandatory for diffuse gliomas in adults. No IDH mutant glioblastoma now. The, the, all the glioblastomas are basically IDH wild type. And any tumor that is now IDH mutant will get a term astrocytoma or oligodendroglioma, uh, depending upon the concurrent alteration that it will have. No such term as diffuse astrocytoma or anaplastic astrocytoma, at least in the adult side. 
GBM diagnosis can be made even without histologic features. So even if you have like a, a diffuse uh, astrocytoma, and I'm using that term uh, uh, here, but we know that uh, IDH wild type uh, tumor should not be given that term, but it, it is basically to imply diffuse astrocytic glioma, which has um, uh, basically any of the molecular features such as EGFR amplification or polysomy of seven, that is gain of seven and combined loss of uh, 10, uh, which is where the P10 is present. So either those, either of those two or presence of third promoter mutation. So these can be standalone criteria or they can be in a variety of different formats, permutations and combinations. Obviously a GBM diagnosis will be will still be made if it is if it has uh, endothelial cell proliferation or necrosis. Mixed oligoastrocytoma is, is uh, essentially extinct now. There may be only uh, rare uh, reports, you know, of hybrid uh, features, you know, diffuse gliomas harboring both of those features. And uh, uh, a lot of um, progress has been made on the pediatric gliomas and glioneuronal tumors or the neuroepithelial tumors. Uh, they are rarer, uh, obviously, pilocytic astrocytoma, which is uh, constitutes majority of the pediatric gliomas and diffuse midline gliomas. There has been a lot more progress uh, that has been made in addition to the diffuse gliomas and other glioneuronal tumors. Uh, location has also been removed for some tumors. For example, cordoid glioma of third ventricle and things like that have been mixoid glioneuronal tumor of the septum pellucidum. So the latter um, uh, terms which uh, contain location have been removed. So I'll just pause here if anybody had a comment because I did see Dr. Uh, Sharma uh, coming in. So I'm not sure if we have a question from the moderators. I'll just pause and if nothing, then I'll start uh, with the first case. You can start with the case, Sonika. Okay. So the five, so the first case is five-year-old girl uh, who presented with uh, actually a huge right temporal hemorrhage. And uh, while this was dissolving, she also underwent a spinal uh, imaging and was found to have a spinal mass. So they went after her spinal uh, mass and they biopsied that. And these, this is the H and D from uh, from the spinal mass. So basically, uh, it has a rather uniform look. So very cellular A to begin with. It's nothing like normal architecture. Has a lot of vascularity as you can see, but the vessels are mostly in glomeruloid type fashion. So there is microvascular proliferation, but it is more in a pattern of glomeruloid type. And then there is some mixoid, this pale mixoid matrix in between. And the cells overall, there is dense cellularity, uh, but this nuclei look rather uh, uniform. And this is just another uh, field which is showing uh, uh, some microsis in between, which contain this pale mixoid matrix uh, microsubstance. And uh, then you have these rather uh, uniform, there is mild pleomorphism undoubtedly, uh, but despite the cellularity, there is not much in terms of mitotic activity. So it tells us, um, what does it tell us? And then some uh, fields had uh, these cells. So I would like somebody from the audience or folks to just send in their responses. Uh, what, what are they thinking? Uh, what should be the next step? And how should we work this case up? So, a uh, a, a tumor that has a fine fibrillarity in the background. You can notice that it has this cobweb sort of appearance. Some pale mixoid matrix we saw. There was 
uniformity, but we also are seeing some of these multinucleate cells overall, less the mitotic activity isn't much. And then there is a glomeruloid type of microvascular proliferation. This is KI67, which uh, essentially confirms our morphological impression that the KI, the mitotic activity is pretty low within this tumor. There are scattered uh, immune cells and endothelial cells that are lighting up, but the tumor cells are essentially negative. So if we have any responses from the audience, it will be great to know those uh, because I think uh, I was told this would be an interactive session. At least uh, there will be some delay, but I'll be happy to uh, receive uh, folks' comments and thoughts and how and what should we do now. Next. You know, Dr. Uma Devi, Manikam, she thinks it is astrocytoma, but uh, not the type of the uh, blade. Then uh, Satya Dutta says this is ependymoma. So ependymoma means it's, uh, I don't know, a grade is what grade they are saying. Okay. But I feel, uh, have you done the reticulin stain? Reticulin is negative, sir. Okay. Could it be mesopapillary ependymoma? So that's a good thought because of the myxoid matrix um, that certainly uh, mixopapillary ependymoma can be a consideration. They, those can also have glomeruloid type microvascular proliferation. However, I was pointing out at these cells which are essentially pennies on a plate and uh, I wanted to uh, grab your attention. Uh, now, areas like this certainly uh, as uh, uh, Sharma sir mentioned, you can certainly uh, see in mixopapillary ependymoma, but typically we'll have some vessel in the center. The mixoid change is seen, but it is seen in the walls of the blood vessels. And here, if you see there is microcystic change, you can see extracellular also, and it can be much more evident in the tumor stroma outside of the blood vessels. But in the initial stages, the changes uh, and in the cases that are not as full blown and um, well developed cases. It begins essentially at the blood vessels. And when you look at the, this case, you do have a lot of vessels, but uh, you are really not appreciating that hyalinized wall with that myxoid matrix. The myxoid matrix is coming, but it is further out, you know. And uh, I think uh, the giveaway in this case was these pennies on a plate. You do have some cells here which have longer processes, or at least it raises the possibility of pyloid-like cells. I do agree. They are not very characteristic uh, of that, but it does have longer processes, and you can see tenacitic cells even in ependymomas, and there is a variant of ependymoma, which is tenacitic ependymoma. So certainly that will be, and here again, there is a vessel where we are not really appreciating uh, that change, but it's a it's a good uh, differential and very good differential. So we had uh, called it as low grade astrocytoma with pilocytic features to begin with, and we had done BRAF fusion in this case and BRAF E six hundred E both had come back negative. The targeted NGS had revealed an FGFR one alteration. There were two variants, one on the hotspot K six fifty. 56 and the other one E561. But we do know that um, uh, the midline pilocytic astrocytomas, unlike the cerebellar uh, um, uh, pilocytic astrocytomas, where the pilocytic astrocytoma tends to occur most frequently, there they tend to have BRAF fusion is seen in more than two thirds of the cases. But in the midline, uh, location, uh, in fact, supratentorial midline location. And this was, uh, if you noticed, you know, this patient had presented with a bleed and there was a supracellar mass which was extended in, into the right temporal lobe. I didn't spend too much time on the imaging because I really wanted to. Uh, 
to uh, for you folks to take a glance at it. So in the recent times, FGFR uh, uh, family uh, of tumors has has uh, gained attention. Uh, not only for its diagnostic significance, but also for its predictive significance. And that is that now we do have FGFR all, uh, inhibitors available, and uh, there are a lot of trials that are going on. So uh, is it important? Yes, it becomes important to pick up these alterations and sort of, you know, uh, make that because this patient would not have responded, for example, to a BRAF targeted therapy and would rather uh, respond to a, an FGFR altered or FGFR targeted therapy. This is a nice review by Tejas uh, uh, from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering. And uh, I think it, uh, reinforces that majority of the FGFR alterations, at least FGFR1 alterations, are seen in lower grade tumors like DNAT, for example, uh, like extra uh, cerebellar midline pilocytic astrocytomas, and extraventricular uh, neurocytoma is another one where you see this characteristic FGFR1 TAC1 fusion, uh, uh, actually. And then the FGFR2 alterations are also seen in uh, lower grade tumors, such as PLENTY, which stands for polymorphous low grade neuroepithelial tumor of the young. But FGFR2 alterations can also be seen in high grade tumors, as can be FGFR3 alterations. You know. So FGFR3, TAC3 fusion can also be seen in uh, uh, GPMs. So it's not pathognomic of lower grade tumors, but point mutations often are seen in lower grade tumors, whereas fusions, majority of the ones that have the partner as FGFR1, tend to be seen in lower grade tumors as opposed to FGFR3, which are far more frequent in uh, higher grade uh, tumors such as GPMs. And FGFR2 can be seen on both the sides, but more often in the lower grade than high grade. And this was the paper published by uh, uh, David Jones, who was instrumental in, in really picking up these BRAF Kia 1549 fusions, you know, tandem duplication of, of this, you know, in pilocytic astrocytoma. And their group has uh, essentially had shown this back in 2013 that there are several other alterations, you know, that can be seen in uh, pilocytic astrocytomas. And one thing uh, that might be important to note is, uh, is that there may be some tumors that can have concurrent alterations, you know. And I think just to keep this thought in, in the back of your mind, because that this was back in 2013 and things have changed, but it is an important proof of concept here that sometimes these alterations, even though they are driver alterations, they can be concurrent alterations and how they could play an important uh, role in the prognosis uh, of some of these tumors. Uh, Swarika, uh, yeah. before we go further, could you please elaborate if there, are, uh, if you have any experience with any of the platforms which can be used in isolation for assessment of these, like it would be good for the audience to know, especially for BRAF Kia fusion, BRAF V600E mutation, uh, ITD mutation, and uh, FGFR TAC fusion. Like most of the centers in India, we do not have NGS facility. And if you could just uh, summarize which platforms should we, uh, I mean, go ahead with if uh, uh, we encounter such cases and we want to give molecular information as NGS would be a difficult task in most of the places in India. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I think that is, um, that's not only a problem in India, I think that's a worldwide and it's a global problem, uh, you know, because insurance is a big issue even here in US. That's why methylation profiling and methylome uh, uh, has been a struggle, you know, now more recently, NIH has started doing it for free because they received a lot of funding. So Dr. Ken Eldapi's group, they are doing it. And we have started sending, for example, for methylation profiling, we don't have it in-house, 
we also um, are in the process now of doing whole exome and you know and our and whole genome sequencing you know the, we were debating whether we should go with whole exome whole genome so that is still work in progress at our institute you know and how we can reimburse for the uh, methylome but coming back to your point about the so BRAF point mutations at least the v600d we have an immunostain so that can be done and and I think in the past few conferences at the NPA the Neuropath Society of India and the ISNOCON those talks you know from uh, uh, you folks have been very illustrative that you know uh, it can easily be done likewise the BRAF Kia fusion and the BRAF break apart um, fish probe is, is helpful because uh, the fusion probe uh, can be challenging because there are variety of different axons you know that it can bind with so the break apart probe is really good from that perspective you know for the BRAF uh, uh, fish uh, studies um, lastly for the FGFR we don't uh, likewise we don't have like we have the BRAF fusion probe, the break apart probe, we have the BRAF immunostain, but we do not have FGFR, for example, immunostain, because for now there is an FGFR3 antibody. We don't have any experience with that. We don't have any experience with FGFR fish uh, testing. We are uh, detecting all of these by targeted NGS. So it is true and that's why you saw that how this diagnosis was, it was called a low-grade astrocytoma with pilocytic features. Had we gotten FGFR1 initially, perhaps we would have been more uh, dogmatic, you know, and, and called it as pilocytic astrocytoma, you know, and sort of written a blurb, you know, there. And it is a CSF dissemination in the comment. It was a drop met, you know. But I think perhaps we could have been much more dogmatic, I believe, you know, uh, stating that um, since there is high frequency of the supratentorial or extra cerebellar midline pilocytic astrocytomas have this point mutation. And uh, so it is likely and it so, sort of supports that and with the histology and morphology that we were seeing. But since we were not seeing that and we didn't have that information initially we called it as such you know low-grade astrocytoma with pilocytic features and see comment and in the comment we had put in that you know uh, an integrated diagnosis will be issued following um, the targeted NGS results and some institutes here for example they amend the report but for us it is a big deal like to amend the report because it gets counted as a corrected report or something like major, like anything that you do major amendment where you are changing the top diagnosis. So what we have been doing, and it's a different style, for example, MGH, and I know Dr. Lewis's group, for example, they amend their reports, you know, almost all of their reports. But at WashU, what we do is we issue this report and then when the NGS report comes, we issue an addendum and we just say that, you know, this was low grade astro with FGFR1 altered, you know, yeah. I hope it, it helps and it answers some of the questions. Well, how good is uh, ISC for VRAF? Sir, uh, in our hands, uh, BRAF has been working fine. It can be sometimes finicky. So in some uh, cases, uh, we do have to repeat it, I will say, especially in the glial tumors. In the glioneuronal tumors, it still works out little better because the neuronal component gets an accentuated staining or enhanced staining pattern is seen. So it is slightly easier. Yeah, the cases where it would be equal in both of those compartments, you know, it can be a challenge. And more often, I would say, in the glial uh, component, it can be a challenge, you know, yeah. So you recommend Ventana antibody? Yeah, that's what we've been doing. And, uh, but, you know, like uh, here also, there's one person who's, who's excellent and, you know, but it depends upon who's loading that machine and what they are doing. And so there are days when we also have to get it repeated and make sure the control is on the same slide, you know, it goes. But um, I will say that it is, um, uh, 
it has been uh, overall it has been a good experience how much is false positive and false negative in our hands uh, sir we don't because we are always getting the sequencing results let's say i repeated it twice and then or the second time i repeated it and then if i don't see the results uh, uh, convincing then i would say that it is equivocal so i don't go i don't stretch myself you know uh, too much because i know that the sequencing is going to come in those cases so it is uh, difficult to assess in the true sense you know because uh, like from our own experience we uh, we call it only when we are dead sure that it is positive yeah Okay, okay thank you. Can uh, you go to next case? Sorry. Can you go to next case now? Sure. Thank you. Vaishali had a question. Uh, yeah, just there was a one question from the audience. Like, uh, are you giving uh, anti-FGFR therapy in all cases, or is it recommended only for uh, some cases which progress or something? What are the guidelines? Yeah. So there are some trials available, and um, if the patient is eligible for those trials those patients get enrolled for the trials and then if uh, the trial the patient for example doesn't uh, is not eligible then they try to get them you know off uh, those trials and through like industry or industry sponsored those take slightly longer time because of the insurance and all wouldn't pay and so if there is a uh, a rapport with that industry and they have an in interest you know in those cases uh, it will be given to those patients um, if neither of those routes they work then they will go on the conventional uh, chemotherapy in in those cases yeah and uh, and but and every attempt will be made then you know when they recur or, or something like that but as you know these are uh, rather uh, recent developments in the field so there is more drive and because uh, in pediatric tumors we don't have too many of these uh, trials available now we have uh, a huge um, availability of the BRAF inhibitors, MEK inhibitors, mTOR pathway inhibitors, and likewise the HTEC inhibitors for the diffuse midline glioma. And the big one nowadays is the ONC group, you know, ONC201. And I've heard there are several variants of that ONC, uh, uh, which is the dopamine agonist uh, drug, and it is uh, supposed to be giving good results, you know, for those diffuse uh, midline gliomas, H3K27 mutant. But FGFR1, we are still in the end track. Uh, inhibitors those are relatively new we had like the antrac one uh, also is a multi institutional um uh, effort because those cases are fewer in number and there is uh, one of our patients went on an industry sponsored uh, trial also so with that i'll move on to the uh, second case this is from a 74 year old woman who presented with a corpus callosal uh, mass, which is like a butterfly uh, lesion, which with this uh, enhancing uh, ring enhancing component to it. And on uh, low power, you can see that uh, obviously because it was corpus callosum and in the deep white matter, they went and they did a stereotactic biopsy. And uh, much of it is, you can see the native oligodendrocytes, but you are seeing that it is slightly more uh, cellular. Let me just go back. It is slightly more cellular than what we typically are used to seeing, uh, the white matter. Uh, and uh, But overall, uh, doesn't look too bad. In another area, which is right here, you can see indeed these are abnormal cells. Many of these, in fact, are abnormal cells. Maybe this might be a normal oligodendrocyte. But when you compare these guys, they are definitely far more larger, uh, have rather regular nuclei, much more uniformity to them, no necrosis, no mitosis, and uh, essentially rather uh, banal looking or lower grade looking, I would say. But then in other areas, uh, so there were three uh, biopsies, three parts that were sent, and these were all stereotactic biopsies. Parts A and B were essentially 
uh, the, the two slides that you saw. And this came from part C of the same case. And this definitely had a different flavor. Now you are uh, picking up, you know, high cellularity or dense uh, cellularity as compared to the previous two images. And then you are also seeing a lot more pleomorphism and areas of necrosis. And the pleomorphism is unequivocal here, you know, and I think all of us will agree that there is uh, pleomorphism within these uh, cells as compared to the last ones. So with that, um, I would like to know what does the group think or what do the folks uh, think and how should we proceed on this case? So an older person, 74 year old with corpus callosal lesion, midline lesion has a uh, uh, some areas that were very uniform looking, but other areas that are uh, unequivocally high grade with areas of necrosis, a lot of pleomorphism and dense cellularity. Yeah, one of the this thing, faculty in audience is thinking of angiocentric glioma, although I don't agree with that. What's at the, there are some comments like some people are thinking of high grade glioma, GBM, and are recommending EGFR or TERT. Okay. Those are excellent thoughts. And I would agree that we, um, I think as uh, you mentioned, angiocentric glioma, uh, I wouldn't think of that particular diagnosis simply because angiocentric gliomas tend to be more cortically based lesions. They present with seizures. Uh, the cells are uniform, but they tend to cluster around the blood vessels, form these perivascular pseudo rosettes, you know. Uh, so it does have a, a different pattern to it than the one uh, that we are seeing in this particular case. This is a midline lesion. You saw it was infiltrating into the white matter and uh, there was uh, uh, certainly high grade, uh, there were high grade features and geocentric glioma as you all know is low grade uh, tumor. So uh, one thing that people didn't mention, and it is indeed, it was, we thought it was a glioblastoma because it was diffusely infiltrative. It did have uh, atypia, it did have mitosis, it did have necrosis. So you can have either endothelial cell proliferation or necrosis. But I specifically mentioned it was midline in nature, corpus callosal lesion. So one stain that I think would have been helpful, we did uh, do a couple of stains when we signed this out. And those were IDH1 uh, and uh, uh, even though the probability of getting an IDH mutant uh, glioma in this age group is less than 0.1% or so, but it is still worth trying that, you know, and if you have it in house, it's, uh, it's cheap to do uh, uh, an immunostain for IDH and it is, as I said, worth uh, running it. The other stain that we did do and, and one must do if there is a midline uh, glioma and which is diffusely infiltrative is H3K27M. And in this case, both those stains were negative. However, as you are seeing here, uh, there was FGFR3 TAC3 fusion in this case. And I was saying that, you know, um, uh, there is an antibody available for FGFR3. So is there anything on histology? And this tumor did have other alterations as, as are evident, CDKN 2AB loss, which again is a feature of high-grade glioma, P10 loss, third promoter mutation, and uh, uh, MGMT promoter. So anytime we give a diagnosis of GBM, which is IDH wild type or a grade four glioma regardless, you really want to know how, what the MGMT promoter uh, methylation status is, whether it is detected or not detected. And we are using currently methylation specific PCR. There are a lot of places that have switched to uh, targeted NGS itself for uh, the methylation uh, uh, of MGMT promoter. 
So uh, the final diagnosis, integrated diagnosis in this case was added with the MGMT promoter and MGM uh, unmethylated and FGFR3, TAC3 fusion positive. Our initial diagnosis was essentially glioblastoma IDH1 wild type by immunohistochemistry. That's how we write it and WHO grade four. And both of these uh, things had come back later. So we just uh, issued this as an addendum. Now, as uh, as uh, uh, Sonika, there are two questions like, are you using any antibody for FGFR3? And there's another question like, should we consider S3K27 in adults as well? Yeah, so we don't have an antibody for FGFR3. I think I mentioned it earlier also, but I will say it again. No, we do not have an antibody for FGFR3 in house. Yes, even in adults, our routine practice is that um, as long as the tumor is in the midline, whether it's a pediatric or an adult diffuse glioma, we are doing uh, H3K27M staining. So yes, uh, it's, a, it's a very good idea to do uh, H3K27M. We've had a few cases, and in fact, our oldest patient in-house has been a 78-year-old person who had a diffuse midline glioma. So it is still worth a try, you know, and, and worth the try simply because one could argue that, you know, the IDH wild type GBM as well as a diffuse midline glioma H3K27M mutant, both are going to have worse prognosis, you know, like uh, their median survival isn't, isn't uh, uh, more than one, one and a half years. So what's the whole point? I think um, as we were discussing, you know, earlier uh, briefly though, uh, that on 201, you know, the HTEC inhibitors were tried, you know, in these patients with diffuse midline glioma uh, with not as much of success rate, those trials are still ongoing. So I think it will be too early or premature to, to comment too far with that. But what uh, from the snow meeting data and the data that is uh, came out last year, this ONC201 uh, trial has been uh, showing very good results so far. So we are seeing better results, you know. So is there a difference? Yes, it will make a difference eventually, you know, but for a 78 year old, yeah. But I think if it was my family member, it, it would matter, you know. So yes, I think in the bigger picture of things, it does make a difference, yes. So I'll move on to the discussion unless people have uh, other questions or the moderators have any other uh, You questions. can move on to other uh, the okay, discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, these FGFR3 are uh, TAC3 fusion tumors. This, this is an interesting paper um, which was published in 2018. And I think um, uh, it basically reinforces what we saw in this case, you know, in the first two biopsies, you know, that you will see uniform or monomorphous ovoid nuclei. But uh, in their paper, they, um, they recommend that you typically do not see um, marked pleomorphism or severe pleomorphism in, in uh, these tumors, which I suspect is not entirely true because for example, our case, and this is not the only case, I've had one other case where there was marked pleomorphism Partially, the tumor had very uniform look to it, but in other areas, it was markedly pleomorphic. So it might not apply to all the cases, but yes, when it is uh, uh, applicable, at least uh, uh, homogeneously in the entire biopsy, and you think that it is representative in the epicenter of the tumor, because we know as the glioma is infiltrating, you will see only scattered cells, right? So it has to be within the heart of that lesion or within the epicenter of the lesion that the tumor should have these features, that it should be rather uniform. It should have these blood vessels that are or thin capillaries, you know, and they, they discuss about this palisades of uh, nuclei, you know, which will be formed, you know, in a, in a parallel form, you know. And likewise, even around the vessels when they are present, they will sort of form these perivascular sort of pseudo rosettes, but again, aligned very identical or in a row uh, 
uh, microcalcifications are also a feature and desmoplasia to some degree within these tumors. And one thing that can help uh, uh, in, in, in such cases, I did not do CD34 on this case, but the other case that I'm talking about, I did do CD34 and CD34 was positive. In fact, that case also had some neuronal differentiation. So initially I had called it as high-grade glioneuronal tumor. And because there was gain of seven and loss of 10, I had called it as basically uh, in the comment section, I had favored an integrated diagnosis of glioblastoma, but had also recommended to wait for the targeted NGS results to to, for a formal integrated diagnosis. And so this is an important point that they can have CD34 expression in a, a patchy distribution or in a much more diffuse uh, uh, pattern. And CD34 is a marker, um, I think uh, many folks are aware that it is a hematopoietic uh, stem cell marker. And the, it was shown to be of significance in um, and cortical dysplasias and low-grade glioneuronal tumors because of these spider cells, you know, that it stains, uh, cells that have highly ramified uh, processes and were thought to be progenitor cells that no longer holds true, but it is still very helpful to distinguish lesions that are uh, dysplastic lesions or that are uh, low-grade glioneuronal lesions. But this is one tumor, which is high-grade tumor, that will show CD34 expression. Now, because it is CD34 is a progenitor cell marker, as you can imagine, some high-grade uh, gliomas, that is glioblastomas, can show partial expression of CD34. So it's not entirely specific, but it does help when you are seeing this kind of morphology, some high grade features, because typically in low grade tumors, you should not be seeing too many mitoses and things like that. So if you are seeing CD34 with concurrent and, and this group had shown good um, uh, results with FGFR3 antibody. They did have few cases that were completely negative actually. Uh, and um, and very rare positivity, but most cases had uh, good uh, positivity. Another feature which was present only in a very small subset of cases and only in uh, rare cases was diffuse uh, sort of EMA expression, which had this more reticulate sort of um, uh, positivity rather than membranous positivity. And we know that uh, glial processes, they are they have very indistinct cytoplasmic borders because they are forming these neuropil and, and their processes are very difficult. You, it's hard to draw your lines around. But con concurrent positivity for these two markers, if present, can be helpful along with obviously FGFR3. But I think on histology, these features may be helpful in a large uh, percentage of cases, but they are not entirely specific um, as is illustrated by our case. So I'll, I'll take a pause uh, if uh, there are any questions or comments, otherwise I can move on to the uh, third case. Okay, so this is from a 66 year old guy who basically has this cystic mass with neural enhancing nodule in his uh, frontoparietal lobe. And uh, what you are seeing here the, on the HND is uh, really these very ionized blood vessels, some myxoid matrix, you know, myxoid substance that is coming here, which is again, these uh, microcysts sort of. And uh, yeah, obviously there is some cellularity. We can't get a very good glance at what uh, these cells might be, but certainly has a very uh, fibrillary look to it. These are some of the other uh, images. There were a lot of Rosenthal fibers in this case, like really a lot actually, and in some areas, and it was loaded. And, uh, and some other areas, very well-formed microcysts, and then some cells have these mini chemistrocytic sort of appearance, you know, with scant uh, bellies of eosinophilic cytoplasm, eccentrically placed nuclei, not much pleomorphism though. And uh, you are seeing some entrapped 
neuron, which is like rare entrapped neurons. So I'll just take a pause here and and uh, wait for the folks to respond if um, uh, if they have any thoughts and you know how should we proceed you know and what should we do in this particular case. So 66 year old guy, cyst with mural enhancing nodule, highly ionized blood vessels, quite vascular tumor overall. It does have solid areas uh, because this area looks completely solid, does have uh, microsis, uh, does have rather uniform appearance and uh, has this abundance of Rosenthal material. Monica, some people say this is a pilocytic, uh, Dr. Rati says is pilocytic astrocytoma. Okay. Great, uh, I don't know. That's an excellent thought. And that's what I was thinking, but I was, as I was showing here, these areas and there were other areas where it does did have infiltrative margins. But my thought process was also that, you know, we are likely dealing with a pilocytic astrocytoma that does have infiltrative borders or it is a funny pilocytic was where uh, at the time of sign out at multi-headed scope, you know, with our trainees, that's what I said that, you know, but it's very funny. And uh, it did have entrapped uh, neurons. They didn't look like dysmorphic neurons. It wasn't like it was forming ganglioglioma. So clearly it was infiltrative. So it did have a characteristic infiltrative pattern, which would be quite, you can get um, infiltration within pilocytic astrocytoma, uh, especially the ones in the optic pathway are almost always infiltrative, right? And then sometimes, uh, or not, not that sometimes, but frequently in NF1 setting, when they occur in cerebellum also, they tend to have infiltrative margins. But this is a, uh, we saw this was a cerebral mass. Patient doesn't have history of NF1 or I didn't say, so likely um, didn't have. So it doesn't fit in with the our regular impression of pilocytic astros, you know, where some locations it can have infiltrative margins. Now, the ones which used to be called as high uh, anaplastic ones, they could have, you know, infiltrative margins, but this uh, uh, tumor had rather uniform look. It did have microvascular proliferation focally though. So- uh, Sonica, I, other, yeah. other thoughts are like, people are thinking of plenty or an astrocytoma with pyloidophus or a glioneuronal low-grade tumor. Okay. These are the all, which audience has given. All very good thoughts, you know, astrocytoma with pyloid features, great thought. And I think with the new um, uh, WHO coming out and in the C impact, so the pilocytic astrocytoma with anaplastic features, the tumor, you know, which was, which never got a specific um, diagnosis in the previous WHO, but it was thought that those tumors likely correspond to WHO grade three. Now that tumor is being reclassified as high grade glioma with pyeloid features. It has, a, um, although that tumor, the classification of that tumor, high grade glioma with pyeloid features, is the name itself says with pyloid features, but some of those cases may not have pyloid features and it came out on the methylation class, right? But we know that there are certain characteristic features. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So just hold on to your thoughts about, about that entity for now. But yes, that's a, that's a great uh, thought. Another thought which was given was low-grade glioneuronal tumor. Again, the diffuse infiltrative pattern, can it happen? Yes, it can certainly happen. But to get so much of Rosenthal material to get this, uh, which glioneuronal tumor is one thinking of? Then one has to boil down to what 
tumor is, is one thinking of, you know. It doesn't look like usual ganglioglioma as we were discussing, you know, because it uh, didn't have dysmorphic neurons. Neurons look very much like native cortical neurons that were entrapped, you know. Uh, it didn't look like DNET. It didn't fit in with, with that. RGNT, which is rosette forming glioneuronal tumor. So like the entities, the distinct diagnostic classes that we know of papillary glioneuronal tumor, it didn't necessarily fall into any of those categories. And as, as we would do, you know, whenever we have a glioma and we are seeing infiltrative growth pattern, IDH1 will be the first uh, uh, marker that we would want to get at. Get. And this tumor did have IDH1, uh, R132H. And I have to say, I was a little surprised by, by this because I was hoping that this would turn out to be high-grade glioma with uh, uh, pyloid features. ATRX was retained throughout. So for high-grade glioma with pyloid features, again, you will see ATRX loss in those cases. This tumor did have a P53 mutant staining pattern. And on sequencing, it was confirmed that it did have IDH1 and P53 mutation, and MGMT promoter was, was methylated. Uh, because of the presence of focal microvascular proliferation, this was called as astrocytoma IDH mutant WHO grade 4, harboring pilocytic astrocytoma-like features, and MGMT promoter was methylated. This diagnosis was rendered, except the MGMT promoter methylated went in later, but rest of the diagnosis went in as such and the NGS sort of confirmed um, our impression. So as our understanding is growing, it is equally true that we will see some zebras, you know, which uh, uh, our morphological impression is of one thing, but I think uh, it is important to keep the same uh, working uh, workflow. And if you are seeing that there is something funny about a case, there is infiltrative growth pattern, unusual location, it's not fitting in with the locations where you would think. So it is a good idea to run your usual infiltrative or diffuse glioma stains. You know, and I think it's a reinforcement of that um, in this case is, is certainly a reinforcement to, to that impression. So um, back in 2018, this um, uh, 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 the current C impact six uh, was actually uh, this paper formed the basis or the foundation for that high grade glioma with pyloid features diagnosis. And this was initially called an aplastic astrocytoma with pyloid features. Now, because there is no an aplastic astrocytoma, as I was saying in the per the new WHO, so it was not. Um, it didn't make sense, obviously, to have an aplastic just for this tumor, and that's why the diagnosis was high-grade glioma with pyloid features, you know. And this basically has recurrent MAP kinase pathway, so you will you can see BRAF fusion. So a subset of these uh, tumors that we used to call pilocytic astrocytoma, for example, with anaplastic features, will fall fall under that category. But it is true that some tumors may not have with pyloid or pyloid features at all, you know, and they but they cluster together with these uh, tumors that fall under this category of uh, anaplastic astrocytoma with pyloid features. And you can see how these are different from, they segregate from the GPM. This is the Disney, block, uh, uh, Disney plot of the uh, methylation results, you know. And these are the pilocytic astrocytomas. The supratentorial ones, you know, are um, uh, segregating or clustering, you know, separately. Midline ones are clustering separately and posterior fossa are clustering. Now, there are some tumors that are, you know, um, sort of uh, have uh, alterations that are uh, aberrant to that particular group, but most that are aligning or conforming to those clusters are essentially um, uh, belong to that location. And so these will have MAP kinase pathway alteration of which the common ones are the BRAF uh, uh, fusions and BRAF uh, point mutations, but frequently BRAF fusions, CDK and 2AB losses, and ATRX loss. And uh, the importance obviously is that these patients, their clinical behavior is, uh, is different than your regular uh, glioblastomas 
and your usual pilocytic astrocytoma. So, for example, your regular pilocytic or classic pilocytic astrocytoma is right here. And the ones that are the on the methylation cluster, this one, anaplastic astro with pyloid features, it still does relatively uh, better or far better than the GBM, which are IDH wild types, you know, in fact, better than astrocytoma IDH mutant group also. So it's important to recognize uh, this particular group, you know, and uh, the key features will be if one is seeing pyloid features, there are anaplastic features, there is um, uh, there is CDK and 2AB, uh, and FISH can be done for CDK and 2A homozygous loss, right? So that can be done. And uh, ATRX is a, an immunostain that many of us, you know, uh, have uh, who have good, uh, you know, a lot of neuropathology cases uh, in the practice. So I think uh, it's easy to do those uh, stains and the BRAF alterations, obviously. And uh, another thing to note is that the tumors that had the characteristic MAP kinase alteration, and by characteristic, it means BRAF fusions or the point mutations, those tumors actually did better as opposed to patients who had alternate uh, uh, alterations in the MAP kinase pathway. So in this per C impact six, this is what high grade astrocytoma with pyloid features is where this tumor is going to and, and is getting its name from. They have still kept the pilocytic astrocytoma with anaplastic features as a provisional entity, but uh, the uh, most of the anaplastic pilocytic astrocytomas uh, in my mind would fall and do conform to, to this subgroup. And we, we have started calling those as such, you know. So um, in contrast, because I showed few cases that looked like, you know, that they would turn out to be pilocytic astrocytoma, I thought it would, it is pertinent, you know, to bring in, you know, the classic example of pilocytic astrocytoma, which is essentially cyst with mural enhancing nodule in the infratentorial compartment in the posterior fossa in the cerebellum of a child, you know, the three most common tumors, you know, with cyst with mural enhancing nodule, uh, one would think is whether it's a pilocytic astrocytoma, ganglioglioma, or hemangioblastoma, you know, in that uh, location. And you do have a smear just next door here, which shows you these here like cytoplasmic processes and, you know, these where the name uh, pilocytic or pyloid, you know, comes from, which is here, like, so these long, thick processes. And the classic appearance for these tumors is essentially, you know, these very loose areas where you can get, you know, these microcystic spaces. They can have mixoid matrix or they can have very clear sort of fluid or eosinophilic uh, fluid. And these looser areas are the ones that are typically enriched for these eosinophilic granular bodies, these uh, uh, structures that are rather pale and they have granular uh, uh, inner architecture. And then uh, the compact areas typically are the ones that are enriched for Rosenthal material, you know. And uh, these are deeply eosinophilic or hyper eosinophilic homogeneous uh, structures, you know, they are composed of proteinaceous uh, of material and they are actually proteins, you know, including some heat shock proteins, you know, and uh, GFAP surrounds them and some um, uh, alpha uh, crystalline structures. And they do have these uh, cells, you know, these pennies on a plate, a term which was coined by Dr. Shai Tower. Um, and these are helpful uh, in, the, in the diagnosis. They are not pathognomic, but certainly helpful when you are seeing a constellation of all these findings. And BRAF fusion fish is uh, positive uh, in these, in a large subset of these patients. Uh, Two thirds of the posterior fossa ones are positive actually for BRAF-KIA1549 fusion. 
so recently we uh, published uh, this work is just accepted and um, I think uh, I wanted to bring up this a very small point and the point is that the low grade gliomas in general they are they tend to have a lot more immune cell infiltrate and uh, there are drives you know they do they are enriched in microglia as well as uh, T cells so there is some drive now to use immune therapy or you know to use some of those in combination with the targeted therapy such as PRAF you know in these tumors uh, as opposed to the high grade gliomas which often tend to be and are immune cold tumors right they don't have much in terms of any uh, immune cell infiltrate unless a tumor is hypermutant or the tumor mutational burden is high, immune checkpoint inhibitors don't work in those tumors. So these tumors, uh, low-grade gliomas in general, uh, be it low-grade astrocytomas such as pilocytic astrocytomas or glioneuronal tumors such as ganglioglomas are enriched, you know, for um, uh, immune cells. And there is uh, uh, a lot of interest right now on this side, you know, uh, in, in that uh, microenvironment. And so uh, this work basically showed that you do have some sexual dimorphism, you know, in the way the T cells are present in pilocytic astrocytomas in males and females, you know, in the supra and the infratentorial location. So a variant of pilocytic astrocytoma, because we've discussed, you know, some of those uh, tumors, is uh, is this where you are seeing, you know, like again, mixoid matrix, but look at these blood vessels, thin uh, vessels. You do have some uh, pinker uh, look to them. It looks as though they might be forming rosettes. But I think to me, uh, the more helpful stain is, is GFAP. Almost always, even in areas that um, don't look as impressive on h and GFAP uh, really accentuates that staining pattern of the uh, processes, cytoplasmic processes that run and form these uh, uh, rosettes or arrangement of the, these are not necessarily perivascular uh, pseudo rosettes, but the cytoplasmic processes of these tumor cells, they tend to aggregate and then tend to form this uh, thick uh, processes, you know, around these structures. And that really helps. And these uh, is a feature of pylomyxoid variant of pilocytic um, astrocytoma. We don't try to make that distinction now. We say pilocytic astrocytoma with pylomyxoid features or in the comment, you can, you can talk about it. They typically will lack um, uh, Rosenthal material as well as uh, eosinophilic granular bodies, and they are very often located in the supracellar uh, location. So as you can imagine, supracellar location, when you see a tumor that has this appearance, regardless, the reflex is not only are you going to do BRAF um, immunostain for V600E and the BRAF fusion, uh, fish, but you also would like to know H3K27N status, right? So that's important. Now, this is, uh, I just wanted to bring it, uh, you know, here while discussing it. Um, this was a nice uh, case, you know, it is again an IDH mutant diffuse glioma. You can see it's very diffusely infiltrative pleomorphic uh, cells in between. So there is an aplasia. But notice uh, that there are these. Um, eosinophilic granular body-like structures. And so remember, exonal spheroids, because diffuse gliomas tend to in be infiltrative in quality, so they tend to uh, disrupt the synaptic uh, uh, flow of things and the exonal uh, pathway. So you will see these collections of material and these exonal spheroids in turn, you know, sometimes even in diffuse gliomas. When in the epicenter of that tumor, you might not see it, but away from that, you might be able to pick up those, uh, those features sometimes and it shouldn't bother you. But yes, on smaller biopsies, it can be a challenge, you know, and that's why neurofilament stain can be helpful even though you are seeing there are a lot of processes here, there are a lot of native cells, you know, so you know that the native population is being overrun. You could still do, for example, a neurofilament stain, which will highlight the uh, residual axons, you know, in, in this. And so it will highlight this pattern of infiltration rather uh, well. Uh, 
So when we say diffuse gliomas are always infiltrative, neurofilament stain is helpful, whereas well-circumscribed gliomas such as pilocytic uh, astrocytomas and ependymomas tend to be um, uh, neurofilament poor, but we do know that uh, GBM can have can be uh, poor in neurofilament, and when because it grows so rapidly that it will destroy all that it will come in its way, right? So it has destroyed all the parenchyma there, you know. So a tumor can have a solid pattern when it is expensile that it is trying to grow and it is pushing uh, the native parenchyma to the periphery as it is finding space to grow. On the other hand, you know, GBM or other uh, anaplastic oligo, they can also have, you know, uh, solid areas within them or and, and the solid areas are essentially, you know, uh, neurofilament poor because they just destroyed everything. And this is just an IDH stain, you know, which uh, highlighted um, the uh, IDH mutant nature. This was an anaplastic oligodendroglioma, actually. It, it did have microvascular proliferation and uh, marked ATPI in, in other areas and did have uh, concurrent 1P19Q code deletions. So I'll just take a pause and uh, see if folks have any questions or comments. So you can move to the next case, right? Because we are slow. Of I think we have more cases to show. Okay, so I'll just move on. Okay, yeah, so eight year old girl and she came with this um, uh, mass in the uh, basal ganglia thalamus and involving her temporal lobe, mesial temporal lobe. And uh, this is a published case of ours. So I just grabbed some images from there. And you can see very densely cellular tumor uh, has that fine fibrillarity. So we know we are dealing with something neuroepithelial, has increased mitotic or very high mitotic activity, some pleomorphism. And so this tumor um, is, uh, do people have thoughts? Uh, and how would people want to work it out? So this is again, uh, um, areas like this uh, would be quite solid, but uh, in these areas, there may be, you know, you could do a try a neurofilament stain, but this was a very solid tumor to begin with. Uh, it was, uh, because it is involving the thalamus, you would want to do an H3K27M stain, which was done and it was negative. And this case uh, is, is being illustrated because it has rather uniform appearance over on the low power. But as you go on high power, you can pick up that it has high mitotic activity and it does have... Uh, uh, some pleomorphism, you know, the nuclei, nuclear membranes aren't as regular as they were appearing on low power. Low power, it looks like, yeah, it's rather monotonous, right? But on high power, uh, there is ATP and there is nuclear membrane irregularity irregularity. So this was a small cell astrocytoma in a young child, but actually the take home message from this case was essentially that you would want to do an H3K27M stain, even though this was from a, a, a young girl, uh, an IDH uh, uh, stain also, you know, and both of those were negative in, in this example. Now the same tumor, if it was present in the hemisphere right here, right? And if it had similar appearance, one other stain that you would, so instead of H3K27M, if it was cortically based, you would have done an H3G34 stain, right? And you would want to make sure it's not an H3G34 driven tumor. Those tumors will have a concurrent ATRX loss, so that will be another helpful stain. You would do IDH, ATRX, P53, right? And they will often have concurrent ATRX and P53 loss. So a good idea to do that. And then now, as we are learning, there are a large, so if it, in the temporal lobe, cortically based lesion, remember that H3G34 needs to be ruled out and they typically will be densely cellular. They can have embryonal look to them, you know, so uh, that's uh, something to, to keep in mind. But imagine if there's a tumor which is in the frontal lobe, right? Similar appearance and you have that, it's negative for IDH. Obviously in the kids, not that we expect IDH mutation to be present. Um, what other things could one think of, you know? So there are a lot of these uh, tumors now, infant 
so they were called as infantile but my understanding is the who new who is going to call them as infant like hemispheric glioma and those basically are large tumors and you want to do uh, to rule out alterations in ntrac uh, ros and uh, alk and and things and met you know things like that and this is just an example you know uh, which i wanted to bring in for this pediatric like 8 year is a rather old age for uh, the image i don't have the image this came from outside but it is it was a great case because um, of the diagnostic dilemma the outside uh, uh, pathologist had and it was a large hemispheric mass in one year old uh, child and it had this biphasic sort of pattern where you are seeing these larger cells and then it it looked like as though it may have some fibroblastic uh, look to it you know in between especially on this uh, slide but then other areas has much more of that fibrillary look to it you know this fine fibrillary processes and uh, has much more denser cellularity and then these small cells you know which almost look like embryonal cells but are not mitotically active you know and uh, the reticulin stain was was diffusely positive gfap was positive in in a large subset of these uh, cells and then the uh, a small subset of tumor population was highlighted by uh, synaptophysin so this was a patient with desmoplastic infantile uh, ganglioglioma uh, diagnosis and it had a very unusual fusion of dolly 4 you know which we haven't seen in the past so it was just an unusual example and so i thought i'll discuss you know a few of those uh, examples this was a case and i think some of you might have already seen it it was presented at the neuropath conference and this the entire case uh, is courtesy of uh, dr neema sharifai who is a fellow who worked with me on this case and he took uh, great images and uh, this is a young girl um, as you can also see from the mri you know uh, presented with this posterior fossa mass which had internal septation some cystic change but uh, did have areas of enhancement and uh, uh, it it did have these areas where um, there was some dense cellularity present but then other areas had this biphasic sort of appearance again you know like these microses and a uh, 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 lot more uh, looser uh, spaces you know and some fine fibrillary areas so uh, heterogeneous from area to area uh, intratumoral heterogeneity because some biphasic appearance but in other areas it loses that and has much more denser look to it and um, there were areas where it had this rosetted sort of appearance uh, with a uh, central with arrangement of tumor cells around this uh, material um, and uh, palisading necrosis so i was wondering if people have any thoughts young girl um, folks who who attended the anp uh, diagnostic slide seminar shouldn't say but everybody else is welcome to to give their input some participant has uh, said this is medullo okay very good yeah embryon facility is uh, ag agk the 34 mutant glioma uh, okay okay it is good. in the posterior fossa okay so yeah so i think um a medulloblastoma uh, certainly on imaging that was a diagnostic consideration even by our neuroradiologists so posterior fossa mass three big tumors that form 75% of then 75% of the times we will be right pilocytic astrocytoma certainly can have similar appearance although more classic is cyst with mural enhancing nodule uh, they are uh, an ependymoma is another tumor that often will occur in this age group and medulloblastoma as somebody suggested it um h3g34 uh, mutant uh, glioma i would put less on my differential here simply because those are typically cortical hemispheric lesions 
very often seen in the temporal lobe. Medulloblastoma is a good thought. Um, what I don't like about medulloblastoma, so while discussing this case when we got it, um, uh, these areas are not good for medulloblastoma, right? It has this biphasic sort of appearance. Can you get sometimes? Yes, you can get microcystic change, but overall the cellularity isn't um, isn't that dense, right? And for medulloblastoma, we would have expected to see much more mitotic activity. For example, in this field, a lot of karyorectic debris would have shown up by now, which we are not seeing, but you are right. It does have dense cellularity and it does uh, uh, raise that possibility, but then other areas have much more of that fine fibrillarity to them and has this palisading necrosis. Microvascular proliferation and palisading type necrosis are not very common findings. You could sometimes see it, but not very common findings, more geographic areas of necrosis. So uh, we did do, um, uh, our diagnosis was we are dealing with a neuroepithelial tumor and it did have high grade look to it because of those dense cellularity and the KI67 was high. But what was what came as a surprise was two bread and butter stains of ours, right? GFAP for glial differentiation and synaptophysin for neuronal differentiation and both the stains were dead negative. So we did a lot of other stains as you can see and it was negative for um, most of, of those. However, we did do and that one stain which really uh, grabbed our attention and which was very helpful and made us feel better because at the end of the day, we are um, histopathologists and morphologists. And uh, there was no way, uh, you know, it was hard to buy that we are not dealing with a neuroepithelial tumor. And all it too was, it was positive in a very small uh, percentage of cells, but it was indeed positive. So a very helpful stain. And then we did a magic marker, you know, which we anticipated would come back positive. KI67 was high and that was B-Core. And B-Core was diffusely positive in this tumor. And uh, the, the sequencing came back as there was internal tandem duplication in B-Core gene in this case. So the final diagnosis was CNS tumor with B-Core internal tandem duplication. But before that came, we called it as high-grade neuroepithelial tumor with B-Core alteration, you know, and see comment. And in the comment, we said that, you know, it seems to uh, align with, uh, with the morphological description of the ones that have internal tandem duplication you know, uh, but we would uh, uh, wait for the sequencing results, you know, for that integrated diagnosis. And, and you will see why we put in that comment and not like I personally, like even though uh, Dr. Sharifai was very uh, dogmatic that we should top line it as such, but I was like, we will call it as weak or altered and put in the comment and then wait for the sequencing results. Now in the uh, CNS PNETs, you know, the cell paper, I think many of you have already seen it multiple times. There were four variants, you know, uh, of four classes of CNS PNETs, you know, of which one was this high grade neuroepithelial tumor that is B core altered. The others were CIC altered and MN1 altered and FOXR2 altered. And the one that is B core altered typically has this perivascular pseudo rosetted appearance. It can have embryonal look. Obviously, these were all variants of CNS PNET. So, somebody who said that CNS PNET certainly, and that's why it is called a CNS tumor or high grade neuroepithelial tumor and is known by a variety of different names, you know. And this paper from David Solomon's group, you know, from UCSF, uh, essentially characterized, you know, the features, the clinical, radiographical, and genomic uh, findings of these cases. Most of these cases were in cerebellum, but uh, um, uh, a slightly lesser percentage were also seen in cerebrum, um, and uh, typically seen more frequently in younger uh, age group. And the thing that needs to be highlighted is that the typical markers, GFAP, synaptophysin, are often negative. And the markers that typically help are OLIC2 and NUN. So if you are seeing something in posterior fossa that has heterogeneous appearance to it, you know, 
and uh, you are seeing some uh, pseudo rosetted sort of appearance you know they can be homerite type rosettes or they can be perivascular pseudo rosettes you know it's a good idea and if it is negative for gfap synaptophysin but you do think it does have that fibrillary uh, fibrillary look to it or neuroepithelial look a uh, good idea to run these essential markers which typically may not be run uh, olic to a new n you know and uh, uh, bcor obviously uh, was positive in all these cases but uh, the reason uh, to hedge in that not to hedge or to specifically say with itd is because there are other tumors that can have bcor protein uh, expression. And these are pediatric gliomas that were described by Sanders group at uh, uh, Boston Children's, you know, with DP300 uh, B core fusion, astroblastoma like neuroepithelial tumor with MN1 rearrangement. You saw that in the CNSPNET. In fact, in the methylation class also, they, they tend to cluster. Um, so the ones with MN1 are rearrangement and the high grade neuroepithelial tumor NOS. So this tumor has gotten its uh, name now, uh, a separate name uh, as CNS tumor with BCOR internal tandem duplication. But the story doesn't end here because there's a very recent paper that came out, not that recent, but I don't think so. The WHO, the new WHO has uh, makes a mention of it, you know, is this EP300 B core fusion. Uh, so this is the paper that was described by Sandar's group, you know, that this four uh, tumors, they tended to be supratentorial. And uh, these patients were both low grade and high grade tumors. B core was positive, but these tumors on methylation, they aligned uh, more closely with the low grade glioma group, which was the MIB and the MIB ligand group. So essentially these were low grade glioma group, you know, but the B core ITD group, you know, the internal tandem duplication, which our tumor conformed to, you know, and the B core protein is also seen in both of these is uh, high grade and they they tend to have a worse outcome although these also despite their low grade nature the uh, ep300 b core fusion also uh, they had a shorter uh, um, uh, um, follow up period but they tend to be doing so far but i would say that you know we need to wait and see but i think the methylation class is more or less uh, aligns with the MIB and MIB ligand group. However, the interesting thing is this, uh, these three cases that have been recently published from uh, uh, a group in France. And these all tumors, they tend to be high grade, but BCOR tends to be negative, but they have similar fusion uh, either with BCOR or BCOR ligand one, you know. So it's interesting, this field is still evolving. And so, you know, will it be apt to say them as with internal tandem duplication, you know? If you do have the protein expression and you do get confirmation by sequencing, go for it. But otherwise, it's a good idea to say BCOR altered and then make a mention low grade versus high grade. And depending upon the alteration, add that, you know. So I'll just pause and see if folks have any questions or comments. Otherwise, I'll move on to the next question. Uh, next case, excuse me. So Nika, one of the feature I believe is for this B core and tumor is the less celerity, uh, uniform thin wall vascular channel, and it's just like the clear cell sarcoma of the kidney. Yes. Or the sum of the myxoid tumor which has been this B core alteration in uh, infancy in the abdomen. Uh -huh. Totally I agree, think. sir. Totally agree. And features. I didn't have the yeah. I didn't have the. Um, smear on this case for uh, this one, but in the diagnostic slide seminar, we did have this um, uh, smear crush uh, preparation, and uh, that is a, a great point, and uh, thank you for bringing it up. It is much more uniform on low power, you know. Uh, I don't think there's any question from the okay. participant. Uh, the okay. only question is like, are you doing methylation profiling for all gliomas? No, we are not doing it on all the gliomas, but we are doing it on cases um, 
uh, which are challenging. So uh, doing it more on the pediatric side uh, so far, but we have done it on the adult side also, uh, where uh, we have found some challenges in the diagnosis. But having said that, um, there are some limitations of the, of the methylome because some of the entities, for example, plenty, is not there. I had a case, you know, which uh, I suspected that it is a malignant transformation of pl plenty, for example, but uh, plenty is not there on methylome. So you really need to have, and the Heidelberg, the beta classifier is still working on it. So uh, hopefully the newer version will have uh, that added. Uh, likewise, there was a case um, uh, we had, which was called outside as an embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. It was a pont pontine mass, dural based mass. And it came to us and it was, we called it as medulloblastoma, medullomyoblastoma because it did have skeletal muscle differentiation, you know, strap cells and all. But it did have a compelling GFAP, olig 2 and synaptophysin positivity. And, uh, and so there were two places that were on one side and two places, two places, you know, and so really, uh, does it make a difference? Yeah, it, it does, because um, the, the for the CNS sarcoma, they wanted to just give the local radiation. But if we were uh, the given the diagnosis of medullomyoblastoma, they would have gone ahead and done craniospinal, you know. So there is some uh, treatment modality that differs sometimes in these poorly differentiated malignant tumor. And we did send it, for example, for methylome because of the tie that we had, you know, uh, Hopkins and we were on one side and then St. Jude and one other place, you know, uh, uh, Mercy here, they were on the uh, opposite side, you know, of the fence. And the methylome was done on that case, for example, but um, it aligned with the embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma group. But the caveat is they didn't have any embryonal rhabdo, uh, excuse me, any medullomyoblastoma in the classifier, even in the beta classifier. So how do you know, right? So uh, so there are limitations. Was the methylation and the epigenomic profile um, detecting the skeletal muscle differentiation, you know, within this, and that's why those are aligning. And my suspicion is that is going to be true that medullomyoblastoma cases will align pretty close with the embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma group that have abundant skeletal muscle differentiation, you know. So there is, so no one platform is, uh, is a magic uh, tool for us. And I think we have to take everything into consideration, but it does help in, in some instances. And I think help in the sense it gives one other objective um, evidence and piece of data for us to integrate into the report. Because if we are thinking of, of something along one line, one entity, if we have methylation uh, profiling help us towards that, it is excellent. But in there are limitations of that platform. I think and the I methylation think classifier itself in its, in its I, I shouldn't say infancy, but it needs to be enriched with much more data and cases to be much more accurate. Yes. Because we have also been using it in 80% of the cases, there is an agreement, but I still think uh, the data needs to be put in. Yes, and that is a great point. I think um, uh, NIH therefore here has um, is uh, enriching like from the entire country here, you know, we are sending uh, all of the places are sending their challenging uh, cases to them. And there are a lot more small clusters that are evolving, you know, and it's very interesting to attend those tumor boards and see how um, many of the cases don't necessarily fall into, you know, like, methylome may not be uh, the only way to answer, but in conjunction with other platforms helps arrive us with more confidence to a certain diagnosis, you know, and in some cases, it really, I think, is... Uh, yes, in coming is years, right. yeah, when we have more and more data, right. methylation profiling would be much more promising. Agree. Okay, do we have time to continue or shall we just stop here? Uh, uh, I'm happy to do this case. Um, yes, we can have it as a last case. Yeah. Okay. So 56 year old man who has this uh, temporal mass and you can see that, you know, it has uh, flare abnormalities, some enhancement. And uh, this is essentially the 
H and D. And you can see that it has some, so uh, again, fibrillary background. So we are dealing with something glial, has these uh, cells that have abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. Some cells really don't have too much, you know, so some cystic kind of change there. And you go on high power and you see that, yeah, there are a lot more of these cells. Do people have any thoughts? And uh, there is some, there are some cells in them. I, I'm not going to say too much because I want people to give their input. I can point out to things. I, I'll go back and, and sort of point out to pertinent uh, points. I know there is a lag, so I'm just going to uh, go back and just, you know, for folks to just revisit the case. Vishali, is there any possibility from the audience? No, sir, not yet. A granular cell so. astrocytoma is one of the possibilities. Yeah. Excellent. Somebody nailed it. Yeah, this is what it is that, you know, I think it's one of the most beautiful cases of granular cell astrocytoma that I have seen. I've seen in the past uh, three other cases, but I think this case just uh, stood out, you know, for its beauty. And there were other areas where, you know, it gets much more cellular. And I think the take home is that, you know, uh, the cells can have very banal look. And sometimes if you have a small biopsy, there might be other things to consider, right? And, uh, but granular cell astrocytoma is a good idea to keep in mind, you know, and in the background uh, uh, in such instances. But once you have uh, these moderately cellular areas, quite easy. You do have uh, in between these smaller fibrillary astrocytoma-like uh, uh, cells also. So it's a combined, uh, and which often happens in these granular cell astrocytomas that you will see some fibrillary astrocytoma component also, but this was dominant, uh, uh, dominantly enriched for um, granular cells. And uh, these are often IDH wild type. This case turned out to be IDH1 negative. We did do that in house. You know, it did have seven plus and 10 loss, CDK and 2A loss. There was EGFR deletion and TERT promoter mutation. MGMT promoter was unmethylated. We had called it as diffuse astrocytic glioma because it didn't have microvascular proliferation or necrosis. It did have increased mitotic activity, uh, but based on uh, seven gain and 10 loss, we had already called it as WHO grade four with molecular features of glioblastoma, but um, third promoter mutation came back as positive on the targeted NGS which reinforced our impression. And this uh, was published by Foster's group from Hopkins, a granular cell astrocytoma. This was uh, an year ago, I think now. Uh, and almost and all the cases that they had uh, were IDH wild type. But it is interesting to note that between less than and more than 60 years of uh, age, you know, there was a uh, difference in the survival. So it is uh, a pertinent point to be made that, you know, uh, patients who are older are going to do worse, you know, in, in these uh, tumors. Other things, uh, gender and location didn't really matter. So I think uh, we can uh, pause and I would like to, unless people have other questions, but I think I would like to uh, thank you all for your attention and um, and thank you again for the opportunity. This is our division here of uh, neuropathology. Uh, our chief, uh, Bob Schmidt, uh, other attendings, Joe Corbo, uh, Rick uh, Perrin, and uh, our fellows, uh, Nima Sharifai, uh, I was talking about. Kate uh, Schweiti was our uh, ex-fellow. Uh, She's come back as attending. And uh, Phil Han goes as second year now, you know, and we have a new incoming fellow. And really our main uh, person who does everything uh, in-house is Jordana Stewart. She is uh, the main pillar for neuropath, if I may say so, you know, and runs, make sure our service runs smoothly. So with that, I would like to thank um, you all and for the invitation. And it was great uh, to have this interaction. And we'll be happy to answer uh, any questions or take any comments uh, that folks may have. Sonika, thank you for uh, showing wonderful cases.
Thank you, sir. Coming from you, sir, that means a lot. Thank you. <laughs> I have one question, uh, just my, for my clarity. Sure. For example, uh, mixopapillary, you have not touched the topic, but uh, yeah. in mixopapillary aponymoma, they now raise it to a grade two. Yes, 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 sir. And one of these shows metastasis. Right. Of course, the recurrence is uh, high. Right. But phyllocytic also, also shows the same. Uh, so, do you right. agree to this uh, grade two? For mixopapillary ependymoma, I think, sir, the, the ependymoma class is going to be revisited um, uh, in my mind because um, there are new classes that are evolving, sir. Like, for example, subependymoma, like the grade ones that we think, like there is now new cluster that is evolving that some chromosomal gain um, that is third promoter, it's uh, behaving in a worse fashion, so they should actually be grade two, or their prognosis should be. So I, I think there is still some evolution needed. But you are absolutely right that pilocytic astrocytomas do have high rate of CSF dissemination, and like you know, like the diffuse leptomeningeal uh, glioneuronal tumors, you know, they are two or three, and essentially because of that, you know, even though they have BRAF. Uh, fusions, a large percentage of those cases, because they are along the neuroaxis. And such tumors, you know, that have uh, the pilocytics that have CSF dissemination, should they be uh, upgraded? Or what is the behavior of those tumors? There are um, there is dearth of literature, sir, uh, sir. And we often discuss this point in our tumor board also that what happens to these kids, you know, who have pilocytics with CSF dissemination. But unfortunately, we do not have a lot of studies that have done uh, good work on that aspect. You know that the ones that had both of those, you know, like concurrent uh, CSF dissemination versus that did not have, and how those are really clustering and where, and is there anything different about those? But that area is still, there is void of, of literature, sir. And uh, what will you call when the mixopapillary in the supratentorial location or in the posterior fossa? Yeah. I had one case, sir, and um, it was not purely mixopapillary ependymoma. It was ependymoma, but it did have mixopapillary features. So I basically uh, called it, this was before this upgrading, uh, the new schema has come, the revised version has come. This was six, five, six years ago, and it was in the um, posterior fossa, and it did have... Um, Mm, mixopapillary features. So I called it as ependymoma with classical and mixopapillary features, WHO grade two, based on the predominant and the upgraded classical variant. But now anyways, it doesn't really matter, yeah. And uh, your first case was, uh, there were two lesions. One was supracondory, I think in the supracellular, that has not been biopsied, sir. So that patient is a recent patient. So they, in fact, we just discussed it in on Thursday in our tumor board, and the patient is going in for a surgery um, uh, next week, sir. So we don't have the diagnosis for the supracellular lesion. If you wanted to know what the supracellular lesion was, no, someone from the army they referred one case to us, and okay. uh, unfortunately, I was more in favor of ependymoma. Okay. Similar case, okay. and ultimately we called it as a pilocytic. And okay. uh, after some, I think six months, they operated the supracellular also. That was also pilocytic. Okay. So I wonder whether this entity is always uh, there. Yeah. Centric. <laughs> yeah. No, I think, sir, it it amazes me that um, we can have morphological many look alikes, but how we put everything into context, our immunostains, our imaging, understanding of the location and other factors, as well as the molecular alterations, you know, uh, to arrive at that integrated diagnosis. And I think that's the theme of, of, of things, you know, that no one platform, because uh, like every place, you know, uh, there are some colleagues who get very excited, you know, if they read a paper next day they want that in-house you know hey can we get it you know we have this can we bring it in-house it's showing you know it's a great paper in nature or something 
but that's not feasible we all know that so yeah thank you vishali any question from audience uh, uh, no questions uh, sonika i have a list of compliments like lovely beautiful relevant cases very nice presentation with detailed discussion which was a wonderful feast thank you very much no thank you and uh, thanks to all of you really appreciate it yeah thank you so over to professor vacant thank you thank you um sonika such a lovely talk you have given and uh, i enjoyed it thoroughly neuropathology has always been so fascinating and uh, it's so nice that the cases you presented really illustrated just how advanced neuropathology has become and uh, so much molecular pathology is now taken over the subject but uh, we are always very happy that uh, neuropathology in aims has been so ably uh, uh, put at the international forefront of both research and diagnosis by our uh, dr chitra sarkar who despite being dean and head of department was able to ensure that this laboratory has always been the best in our department and all over the world of course um, dr mc sharma and uh, dr vaishali thank you so much that uh, you brought the discussion alive with your comments and of course uh, we are always uh, happy to have the uh, services and the research which neuropathology has been at the forefront because their research output is more than the rest of the department i think put together they have the best students the best theses the maximum number of phd's and uh, some of the most advanced papers in international publication uh, i would also like to thank dr chitra that when she was head she started this webinar and this webinar has been able to bring me together with the those who were senior to me those who were junior to me everybody from the past has come back to the present thank you so much sonika you gave a wonderful talk we would thank love you. to have you again thank you thank, thank you to thank the you, uh, rest of the webinar team uh, dr anchal dr uh, kavneet aruna madhu ruchi this team is awesome and uh, i'm so happy that they continue to do this webinar with so much enthusiasm thank you one and all for tuning in Thank you. Thank you Sorika. Thank you. Sonica. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks Sorika.